We begin a new series, and it's on living in a financial overflow. How many people want to live in a financial overflow? I do. Hallelujah. And today, I'll be ministering on the drought is over. The drought is over. Moving from scarcity to abundance. I want you to declare to yourself, the drought is over. I'm moving from scarcity to abundance. Come on, say it again. The drought is over. I'm moving from scarcity to abundance. No doubt we're living in a time where, because of the interest rates, a lot of items has gone up in prices, and people are worried with the news and the media, the statistics, and even just coming out of COVID, and people are worried. And let me quickly read some statistics. The U.S. cost of living in 2022 is increasing faster than it has in de- decades. As the price of food, real estate, healthcare, transportation, and even homeowner insurance and car insurance goes up. Just recently, it was announced that the social security cost of living adjustment for January 2022 was 5.9%, the highest increase in 40 years due to the current increased cost of living. It's been predicted that the social security for 2023 could be as high as 8.9% or even higher. Last month, food at home prices jumped 11%, the largest 12-month increase since November 1980. These statistics can be very scary. And the economic news and all of these statistics should not be ignored. But as Christians, as child of God, we should interpret them in the light of our covenant relationship with God. We are a people of covenant. Even though we're hearing of these news, but we should take notice of them, but we shouldn't be bothered by them. Because we're a people of covenant. Hallelujah. We are a people of covenant. Say to yourself, I'm a people of covenant. I'm a people of covenant. You will agree with me that many times, even as Christians, despite all of God's promises, things can be very scary. How many people can agree with that? You think about what if, what if, how do I do this? How do I pay for this? How do I pay for that? Even in all of this, we can't deny that. But we have to live our life by the word of God. We have to live our life by his promises. He says in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 that, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory, in Christ Jesus. God recognized that there will be drought. God recognized that there will be inflation. Interest rate will go up. God is not surprised. God is not caught by surprise. Why? December, 20, December 28, 2021. God gave our senior pastor some words. And I happen to be the one who read that word of prophecy during NIBEX 2021. And I'm going to read one part. It says, things may be hard out there in the year 2022, but in my household, things shall be good for as many that seek me. Those who seek me will enjoy, and my people will enjoy the Goshenite anointing. Come on! God spoke to our senior pastor that as long as we stay connected in this house, we are going to be your people of abundance. Yes. We are going to be your people of Goshenite anointing. Yes. Why some people are hungry in Egypt, those in Goshen, they are enjoying. They are having more than enough. And that is who we are. And that is the word we brought to you today. So it does not matter what the news is telling you. Hold on to God. Hold on to the word of God. And hold on to his covenant with you. Hallelujah. What is financial scarcity? Scarcity is not the absence of money. Financial scarcity is not the absence of money, but it is the absence of you having sufficient enough to meet all of your needs. When you do not have enough to meet all of your financial obligations, that is financial scarcity. It could be that you are having more wants than what you need, but the fact remains that you do not have enough to meet all of your needs. But in Psalm 37 verse 19, the Bible says, they will not be ashamed in the time of evil. And in the days of famine, they will have plenty and satisfied. 
What is financial abundance? Financial abundance is not the multiplicity of money. It is not you being Jeff Bezos' son or daughter of family. It is not how much money you have. But it is you being able to meet all of your needs when you need to. It is you being able to tap into an overflowing reservoir of resources. It is you being able to tap into the abundance of God supply. That when you need it, God is giving it to you. There are people who have money, 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 but they are lacking. There are some people whose problem money cannot solve it. But financial and abundance of God is you having all you need when you need it and you're tapped in and you're connected to the grace of God and at any time you're in need of something, God is supplying you. That is financial abundance. Come on, let's give God the glory. Let's give God the glory. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 8, it says, it is relying on God's word that is able to make all grace abound towards you in having sufficiency in all things. I want to begin by explaining to fundamentally opposite mindset of people when it comes to abundance and scarcity. You can either approach life with a scarcity mindset or you can approach life with an abundance mindset. It is not so much about what you have or what you don't have, but it is how you see life. Do you see life as the glass is half empty or half full? They're two different perspectives and they mean totally two different things. Hallelujah. A scarcity mindset is, I never have enough. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough opportunity. I don't have enough friends. I'm not looking good. People don't like me. It's always something is not right. But an abundance mindset realizes that I am unique in my creation. And I have all sufficiency. God has given me everything that I need to be who I need to be. There are two different mindsets. A scarcity mindset believes that if you are successful then you're robbing him of his own success. And jealousy comes in. And anger comes in. And anxiety comes in. That is a scarcity mindset. If someone is doing great, and you're not happy about it, that is scarcity mindset. If we don't struggle to breathe, we have so much sufficiency of air to breathe in, then why should you be worried that if someone is making it, he's taking away your own success? Why should you be concerned that if someone is making progress, he's going to rob you of your own progress. That is scarcity mindset. But an abundance mindset knows that God is the owner of everything. And he has called you into a life of abundance. And he will give you all that you need to succeed in the life that he has called you to. Hallelujah. The mindset comes from a deep sense of inner worth. Gratefulness to God. And security in your covenant promise. Apostle Paul said, My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. I want you to declare to yourself, I shall have financial abundance because my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42, 44, we can see two types of mindset. It was a time of famine in Israel. A man came to give bread, loaves of bread, to the prophet. And his servant, Gehazi, said, let me read. He says, when the man brought the bread, Elisha said, give it to the people to eat. Then his servant said, how can I say this before a hundred men? You see, to two type of mindset. Elisha said, give it to them. They will eat and they will have leftover. Then he set it before them and they ate and, and they had some leftover according to the word of the Lord. You see, same situation, two people. One sees abundance, one sees scarcity. The servant says, 
It will not be enough for 100 people. That is scarcity mindset. But the prophet said, give it to them. God said, I will meet all of your needs. And God actually did meet all of their needs. And that is two different mindsets. A scarcity mindset focuses on its limited resources. Oh, because you don't have the ability, then it cannot happen. But an abundance mindset sees the limitless possibility of God. Sees the fact that God is the source of all creation. And as long as I stay connected, God will continue to meet all of my needs. Hallelujah. I'm going to use two case studies to show the two mindsets. The Israelites, the Israelite, I'm going to use them. After 400 years in slavery, God sent a servant and God delivered them. God had to deal with the Egyptians with, a lot of, with seven plagues. In fact, their son had to die. They went through the Red Sea. And now they're on their way to the promised land. But here what happened in Exodus chapter 14 verse 11. They doubted God. When the Red Sea was coming, they began to tell the prophet, oh, is it because there are not enough graves in Egypt that you have to bring us here so we could die? That is scarcity mindset. When God is taking you through transformation, do you see what God is trying to do or you are reacting by the present pain of transformation? That is what happened here. In Exodus chapter 16 verse 15, they doubted his supply. Now they are on their way to the promised land. Their resources are finished and God provided manna that he had never given anybody ever in this world. And God told them, you can only have what you need for that day. Do not keep anything for the next day. What did they do? They disobeyed God. Why? Because of lack mentality. Because of a mindset of a lack. That maybe tomorrow it will not happen again. Where are you doubting God? Where are you trying to do what he has not told you to do? Why are you keeping what belongs to God? Because you are thinking you will not have enough to pay your bills. If you're doing that, you're like these people. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 32, when they were getting to the promised land, they sent them to go spy on the land. Virtually all of them came back with bad reports. Hear what they said. In verse 32, they said, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all of the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giant, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. When you have a scarcity mindset, you undermine yourself. They undermine themselves. It's okay for somebody to have an opinion of you, but you don't know. How can you now know what they are thinking about you? They said, we were like grasshoppers in their sight, and so were we in their own sight. How can they know how those people see them? It is small-mindedness. They describe themselves as grasshoppers. I pray in the name of Jesus, every small-mindedness, daring you from going after God's largeness, is broken this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Our forefathers grew up under different circumstances. And many of you, even though you're, maybe you were born here or maybe you are first generation immigrant, but you don't know the life your father or grandfather or great grandfather or great great grandfather lived. Could it be that there's some things we're struggling with? Could it be that there's some realities in our life that were passed on to us from generations? to generations. For 400 years, they lived in slavery, in scarcity. And so even when God is doing great and mighty things for them, they couldn't see it, partly because of the life they lived. The second case study I'm going to bring is Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua, they have a different mindset. 
they have an abundant mindset. Same people, same time. They were both in slavery. They both had the same circumstances. But Caleb had a different report. Caleb had a different report. How can one person out of the lot have a totally different mindset? Because he grew up in the same community as them. Numbers chapter 14 verse 20 shows how God sees that. He says, because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. In 45 years after spying on the land, and Caleb gave a good report. He himself said in Joshua chapter 14, verse 7, he said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to scout the land of Canaan. And I brought a report back to him as it was in my heart. My brothers, my fellow spies, who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt with fear. But I followed the Lord, my God, completely. He has a different mindset. I'm here to encourage you. For you to live in abundance, for you to move from lack to abundance, you have to have a totally different mindset. A mindset that is not feeding on the news, a mindset that is not feeding on the statistics, a mindset that is not feeding on what people are saying about to, but a mindset that believes in the abundance of God. A mindset that believes that God can do all things, that God can give you all things. That is the mindset that Caleb had. He said, because I believe in my God wholeheartedly. He believed in God. And that is why he came back with a positive report. So think back into your life. Think about different opinions and reports of people. Even the ones you've had about yourself. Could it be wrong? Could it be a mindset thing? You go to the hospital, the doctor is saying, no, no, no. That's what's going to happen to you. That's his mindset. But you are a child of faith. You see differently from him. I want to encourage you this morning. Every second of your life, everything you do, always be conscious of the mindset you have. Always be conscious of the mindset you are using to, to respond to that situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm here to declare that we serve a God of more than enough. I'm here to declare that we serve a God of more than enough. He is our hell Shaddai, the whole sufficient one who specializes in leading his people from lack to abundance. Hallelujah. In our foundational scripture, Psalm 105 verse 37, he says the Lord brought his people out of Egypt loaded with silver and gold and not one among the tribe of Israel even stumbled. Over 3 million people. God brought them out of 400 years of slavery. And you know what happened? You remember the seventh plague? The last one, all the firstborn son of all Egyptians were killed. And you know what still happened? God still caused the Egyptians to have favor upon the Israelites. And they gave them all their valuables. How can somebody kill your firstborn, cost you so much pains, and you still give them all the best that you have? And that is what God did. And that is what God can do for you and I. It is God who is able to do all things. It is God who is able to cause your enemy to have favor with you. In the name of Jesus. He said, I will grant this person favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. I want you to declare to yourself, I will not end this month and this year empty-handed. I will not be empty in wisdom. I will not be empty in grace. I will not be empty in wisdom. I will not be empty in grace. In the name of Jesus. In this new month, you shall experience the favor of God. Whatever represents lack in your life, the favor will deliver you. Favor will bring you out of lack into abundance in the name of Jesus. By supernatural favor, strangers, 
People who waited them, they began to favor them. And they gave them all their goods. I want to pray that strangers will favor you. Men will favor you. Women will favor you. And none will resist you. Because, because God said, this is our season of financial abundance. In the name of Jesus, has God used this favor to compensate the Israelite for 400 years of labor and lack? God will use favor to level the field for you. He will use favor to balance it out for you. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate God. Come on, let's celebrate God. And God is doing it. Even in this COVID, God is doing it. We've seen testimonies. God healing people. People buying multiple properties. People having new jobs. People getting married. People having all sort of positive experiences. Even in this COVID, even in my house, even in your house, if you're, if you're grateful, you will know that God has been faithful. God has opened some doors, even in this COVID season, that you and I know that it can only be God. And we also saw statistics of more people asking for benefits. And you wonder, we both live in the same city. How is that happening? Even as immigrants, people you met in the system, you're guiding them. It is not ordinary. It is not because you know what to do. It is because the hand of God and the favor of God in this house is leading you. Or come on, let's celebrate God. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 17, when God wiped the entire earth with flood and he preserved Noah. And when God wiped the entire earth and Noah was in the ark, it is the same flood that God used to wipe the entire earth that lifted the ark in the midst of all the waters until that ark came onto a dry land. I declare this morning that the same issues that people are crying about, the same statistics that are causing pains for some people will lift you up and take you to the next level. In the name of Jesus, I declare as Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year under fold, the Lord will make you to prosper in this land. The God will make you to prosper in this land. By the authority and power that is resident in ARCC. This month, the factors causing others to be in lack will lift you up in abundance. May favor open you up. May your creativity be open to maximize your life. In the name of Jesus. Quickly, I'm going to read another prophecy of December 28, 2021 at Nybex. He said, don't be moved by whatever is happening out there in the world. Tell my church not to be moved by it. I am the God in the highs and the lows. I'm the God of the past and the present. Those who sought and connected with me in the past, I have ensured that they're rising no matter the challenges in the society. Let my people look unto me and not to any economic trend. Come on, let's give God the glory. God has spoken ahead of what we are seeing. So don't panic. You just stay connected. Do not panic. Do not worry. If truly coming to church, praying to God, fasting, all these things, you don't want it to be in vain. You have to trust the word of the Lord. This is not even the Bible now. This is the word is sent to you and I in this church toward the end of last year. God prepared us for this moment. I'm here to assure you that God is good. Come on, say, my God is good. My God is good. Because we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him. And I call according to his purpose. Say to yourself, because God is good. Because God is good. Everything he does in my life is for my good. And please don't doubt that. Don't doubt that because sometimes... Some things happen and you begin to doubt him. You should remember that if truly you know God is good, whatever happens to you, like Romans 8, 28 says, it will work together for your good. Because it's the God who has seen the hand from the beginning. Hallelujah. Even Jesus Christ, when he came, said it in John chapter 10, verse 10. 2,000 years later, 
He said the same thing. He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it in abundance until it overflows. Jesus Christ came to give us an abundant life. Hallelujah. How do I enjoy an abundant life? How do I enjoy an overflowing life? Number one, stay connected to Jesus every day. Come on, say that again. Stay connected to Jesus every day. John 15 verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So long as we stay connected, so long as the connection is not broken, that covenant promise would always be activated in our lives. And I don't see us as people of lack. I don't see this church as a church of lack. I've never come across anyone here that God has not blessed. Unless you're not thinking true. Again, remember, the blessing of Lord is not just your material possessions only. God is blessing us in this house. I mean, think about 2019. We've been exempted. And God has been good. So, stay connected to God. Your morning devotion. Loving God. Loving the people, living a life of faith, and staying connected with the vision here. Stay connected in your own little way. Find something and do in this house. That is God's expectation. If truly you are connected, you should be helping to lift the burden. It can be a burden, a good burden. You see the choir ministered? They didn't just come from the house and they sang like that. They come here almost every day to come and practice. Thank you, mommy. Let's celebrate that. It takes sacrifice. Find something to do. And God told our daddy a long time ago, he said, as many people that are connected, every day of their life shall be filled with joy. So I encourage you to stay connected. And as you stay connected, you shall enjoy that overflowing life. Hallelujah. Number two, obedience to God. He says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall hear the good of the land. The key to a life of abundance and success is not just coming to, to messages, going to, to, to success seminars, uh, and giving, but in a life of obedience. God wants us to succeed and prosper. God wants you to succeed and prosper, but God, you, God wants you above all to be obedient to him. He said, obedient is better than sacrifice. If you had only given your offering and tithe the way I had prescribed, if you had only lived your life the way I had prescribed, if you had only treated your neighbor as yourself, if you had only do the things that I want you to do, and I want you to think about it, he wants to prosper you, but you have to obey him. There's nothing God loves more that, than a contrite spirit, a humbling spirit, always knowing that you are here because God allowed you to be. Despite all that we have, it is by his grace that we're standing. See what he says in Isaiah 48 verse 17. He says, I am the holy Lord God, the one who rescued you for your good. I teach you and I lead you along the right path. How I wish that you had obeyed my commands. Your success and good fortune would then have overflowed like a flooding river. He said, how I wish you had listened. You would have experienced me. Could it be that we're the one holding his hand back? We've been taught many times he's a God of principles. He wants to do things, but it's like he cannot he is God, the principles. And so do all you can to follow what God says you should do. And we're being taught well in this house on what we need to do as Christians. And as we begin to obey God, I pray the Lord will give us that abundant life in the name of Jesus. 
And I'm in agreement with you this morning. May the grace of obedience to God drop on us in Jesus' name. Declare with me, because I'm willing and obedient, I shall enjoy the best of New York. I shall enjoy the best of America. I shall enjoy the best of my marriage. I shall enjoy the best of the land. Number three, stop grumbling and start being grateful. Stop grumbling and start being grateful. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says in New Living Translation, In all you do, do everything without complaining and arguing. And an abundant life is a life of contentment. And when you are content, you are grateful. And when you are grateful, you receive more from God. If you are ungrateful, you can never experience an abundant life. Because if you don't see the good that you have, you cannot assess the one to come. And God wants you to have that spirit of appreciation, that spirit of contentment, that spirit of being grateful for where you are. Complaining is bad. Even the doctors will tell us there is, a, there is, there, there is this emotions that comes into your life when you show gratitude. Let me quickly read what I read here in these statistics. Study shows gratitude is the healthiest emotion. When you're grateful, it shows it produces serotonin in your brain. It produces dopamine in your brain. And it produces oxytocin, the feel-good emotions in your brain. So studies also shows that when you wake up and you begin to read the good things that God has done for you, it makes you a better person. It, ge- it opens you up to abundance of what is to come. So I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to start being grateful to God. I want you to start being grateful to God. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, In every situation or circumstance, be thankful and continually give thanks to God. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. I want you to tell your neighbor one more time, stop grumbling and start being grateful. Number four, stop comparing yourself with others and start being content. Stop comparing yourself with other people. If you do, it's going to give you a lot of anxiety. You're going to be jealous of people that you don't have no business being jealous of. You're going to hate people for no reason. And you're going to cut God off from blessing you. And that will not be our portion in the name of Jesus. When you compare yourself with others, you become discontent. Remember the parables of of, of the talent. The ones who had little to him. Even though God gave him according to his ability, he felt that God was unfair. What happened? He lost it. They took it from him and they gave it to the one who already had five. And that's, and the, these are the principles. When you compare yourself, you may lose what you have. In fact, two things will happen. Number one, you would always have people who are better than you. And so when you compare yourself, you begin to hate them. You begin to feel somehow again towards them. And the second thing that may happen is you may see people that you are better of and you begin to feel prideful. You begin to feel that I'm better than this person. And these two emotions, God doesn't want it in our life. To have a life of abundance, we can't hate people and we can't be prideful. So please tell, tell your neighbor, stop comparing yourself to other people. When you compare yourself, you have the tendency to spend, your, spend beyond your earnings. And that's true. People are spending more, 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 more just to catch up with some people. You don't even know what they have and what a fraction of what they're spending. But because you're trying to catch up, don't, don't run people's race. Just live your life. That is what God is saying. When you live your life, you will enjoy abundance. It may not be that you need more money. It may be that you need to reduce your wants and just focus on your needs. Hallelujah. May you experience contentment that comes from a place of knowing that you are unique and that God has great plan for you. Number five, stop being stingy and start being generous. Stop being stingy and start being generous. If you want to move from scarcity to abundance, you need to stop being stingy. Stinginess is a sign of a shortage mentality. If I don't give, if I give, I won't have sufficiency for myself. That's his stinginess. But we're meant to be a conduit of blessing. 
He comes to you, you pass it around. You keep letting it keep going. That's what God expects from you. In First Kings chapter 3, verse 1, he said, The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offering on that altar. He gave what no one has ever gave. One thousand. He was, he was king. His father was king. He's king. He could have just stood there and maintained the same level. But he did far and beyond. What happened? God appeared to him in a dream. And he said, what do you want from me? He asked for wisdom so he could lead God's people. But God said, you've asked for a good thing. But because of this, I'm going to make you the richest and the wisest. And no one has ever beaten his record. Why? Because he gave in abundance. Because he gave more than is required. He gave more than is necessary. He became the wisest and the richest man. God said, if you put me first, I will prosper you. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 6, he says, you have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you are not satisfied. You drink, but you are thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pocket filled with the holes. You expected much, but, you, but behold, it amounted to little. And what you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts. Because my house still lies in ruins, while each of you is busy with your own house. It's a universal principle, and it's biblical. You give, you receive. So, it is not anyone. Think about it. If you're not faithful in your giving, you need to change. So that we don't hold his hand back. So that God can give us abundance. I'm here to encourage you. When we give, it's not because God needs it. It is for you. It is for you and I. So, if you want to enjoy abundance and move from lack to abundance, you need to give. This is the season to give dangerously. This is the season to sow. In fact, let me share a testimony of our senior pastor. He said there was a time. Um, I don't know, there was a church project. And everything they had, they gave it to the church. And they said immediately one of the daughters in college needed money. I think it was just 1400 And the devil came to him quickly and said, you see, you've given all that you had. How are you going to pay? I think it's his rent, our rent. How are you going to find the money? And pastor said immediately he heard another word. That if you don't want me to bless you, it is too late. For me not to bless you, it is too late. This is our principles. And that is what they are teaching us. We have to learn to give to God. He said, if you don't want me to bless you, it is too late for me not to bless you. And he said immediately someone gave him exactly that same amount. And from there, what has it been? I mean, celebrate them. God has been faithful to them. They've done the work, and it's the principle. And we all too shall enjoy the blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. God owned everything. He gave you everything, your breath, your marriage, your children, your wife, your husband, your job. Your... He gave you. He gave you his son to give you salvation. He gave you peace. He gave you joy. He gave you everything. So why are you struggling to give it back to him? He's saying that giving me is a principle. I don't need it. Let me read what he says. In Psalm 50 verse 9, he said, I do not need your booze and gold from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and all the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you because I own the world and everything in it. So it's not about you feeding God or helping God. It's for you and me to prosper and connect with his abundant flow. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate God. Let's celebrate God. Let's celebrate God. Number seven, as I begin to round up, discover your place and prosper in it. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden and he sent water to them. He clothed them. He gave them everything. When you're in your place, you will have sufficiency. When God gives a responsibility, when God gives a purpose, He gives the resources to back it up. Find your place in everything you do, your home church, ALCC, your department, in your family, on the job, in your career, 
the purpose he has called you to, everything. Just continue to stay in your place. Because when you are in your place, God will supply all of your needs. Hallelujah. Finally, plant your seed and make the earth to yield its increase for you. You need to plant your seed. It is not everything that you have that is meant to be consumed. When the Israelites were going towards the promised land, he was feeding them manna. You know what happened when they got to the promised land? Manna ceased. God wants you to reproduce. He's a, he's a God of reproduction. He wants you to produce. So ask yourself, what is my seed? Your skills, your education, your relational skills, your, your, your sense of dressing. Everything you have can be a skill, can be monetized. Ask yourself, how do I turn my seed into my abundance? Maybe God has given you all that you need. So I want to encourage you this morning. Look inward. Maybe you need to start a side business. Maybe you need to start a side project. Maybe you need to write a book. Maybe you need to just do something that will give you extra resources. Because think about it. Nine to five is good. It's a way that God is using to bless us. But think about it. How many millionaires do you know that are in the nine to five bracket? It's only people that create. You have to be your people of creation. God is saying we should stop being consumers. We should start creating. We shouldn't just use our money to, to, to just consume. We should think, even in the life of your children, challenge them and let them be creators. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God the glory. Let's give God the glory. As we close, I ask you, whose report will you believe this morning? Are you going to believe the report of the Lord? Are you going to believe the report of the media? Or are you going to believe the report of his servant? Hallelujah. As Jehoshaphat spoke to Judah and the inhabitant of Jerusalem, I'm here to encourage you to believe in the Lord your God. And you will be established. Believe his prophet. And you will prosper. I want to remind you one more time. Realize that abundance comes from God. Stay connected to Jesus every day. Be obedient to God. Stop complaining and start being grateful. Stop comparing yourself and start being content. Stop being stingy and start being generous. And plant your seed and make the heart yield its increase for you.